Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. My name is Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. This is one of our special episodes from Ottawa, Ontario. And our guests for this evening are Brian and Barbara Lilly. Welcome, both of you, to The Journey Home program. Thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, are you from Ottawa or did you drive in here today? Uh, <laughs> we live in Ottawa, but we're not from Ottawa. Okay. I'm originally from Hamilton, Ontario, which is... Uh, southern Ontario, not far from Buffalo. That would be the closest uh, American city. Yeah. And I'm from a small town called Lennoxville, Quebec, about two hours southeast of Montreal. Okay, so you're close oh. to Vermont. And... Uh, about an hour north okay. of okay. Vermont. All right. We, positioning that for the, those from the states that aren't always... Newport, Vermont. Yeah, are you Saskatchewan? <laughs> or you, no, no, no. no, no you're, you're, <laughs> okay, well, wonderful. It's good to have you with us. Another thing, maybe let the audience know what you do, because you're a bit uncomfortable bit comfortable with being in this spot in front of the camera? Yeah, I uh, worked for about the last 10 years in um, uh, private broadcast radio, uh, major markets in Canada, and recently just joined Sun Media, which is launching a, a new TV station. So right now I'm, I'm writing for the papers and learning where commas go and, <laughs> uh, and, and trying to figure out print, which is so different from broadcasting, as, as I'm sure you sure. know, sure. And, and getting excited about uh, the launch of something new. All right. Well, that's something we can pray about. I mean, that's exciting. And uh, maybe our audience might later be interested to understand, you know, the, the, the difference between the more conservative perspective and the liberal perspective here in Canada and, and the battle that you are right in the middle of, of that public opinion. Uh, that's your world. And that's yeah, what you're doing. Yeah, co covering politics. It's, uh, it's a battle every day, and uh, it's a bloodless sport, though. So that's the good part <laughs> of it. It's, uh, it uh, unlike, At least in these days, it's bloodless. Yeah, it? these days, it, it tends to be bloodless as opposed to um, uh, covering murder and mayhem in the streets. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What I normally do on the program is invite the guests to go way back and start at the beginning and, and give the audience uh, a snapshot of your early spiritual upbringing. So I'm not sure who's going to be first on the tag team, but I'll let you decide. Oh. You go first. Why well, I'm I'm the cradle Catholic of the two of us, and uh, went to Catholic school um, here in Ontario. Uh, was an altar boy, uh, so I had a fairly good Catholic upbringing. And in Hamilton, it's a fairly large Catholic community. Um, it, it was quite good. I mean, you know, we had um, we had CYO. Catholic youth organization, so there were you know sports teams and different things. Uh, the the Catholic high schools were sufficient that we had enough of them. We could have our own um, uh, teams play against each other. You know, we had our own little oh, league Catholic that league. Way. Yeah, yeah. Oh, there you go. Sure. Yeah, and and then you'd play the public <coughs> schools for the the city championship or what have you. But uh, you know, Catholic schools would play against each other, and sometimes the private schools would join us. So. I didn't really realize how much of a, a Catholic environment there was until I left the city, until I left it, which is probably about the same time as I kind of walked away from the church. Never left the church, really, but it wasn't showing up exactly. Okay, gotcha. um, you had made a conscious choice to leave, but just your feet yeah, kind of decided where you know, you leave home and, and uh, you're out in the workforce and you wake up Sunday morning and it's noon and... Thinking, oh, well, maybe I should have been somewhere. In a few weeks of saying maybe I should have been somewhere, you <laughs> start forgetting that you ever were anywhere on a Sunday. And so that's probably, I mean, it wasn't a conscious decision to walk away or anything, but I, I definitely wasn't turning up. And I wasn't uh, on any kind of spiritual walk, mm -hmm. but I knew that there was something missing. Was, uh, it seems, uh, I'm an outsider to Canada, but it seems from what I hear that the state of the church has changed a lot in the last 20, 30 years in Canada, even in the schools, the Catholic schools. When you look back to your upbringing, was the Catholic education that you received a good, solid education at the time you were going there, you think? Well, even back then, in this, we're talking mid-70s through the, the mid-80s, the, uh, the catechesis probably wasn't where it should have been. Okay. But it was probably better than it is now. Uh, one of the things that I discovered when Barbara was becoming Catholic was how little I knew about the church. Uh, there were times when you know she'd come to me with questions, and I'd just say, "Well, I have no idea. Let's go look it up," <laughs> and, and which helped me in, in my own spiritual journey. But when I started going to Catholic schools here in Ontario, anyway, they weren't fully funded. Um, 
we have uh, government-funded Catholic schools here in Canada. It's a historical anomaly yeah. uh, that likely <laughs> isn't going away in, in Ontario anyway. It's disappeared elsewhere. Uh, and But as you got into the later grades of high school, you had to pay. And so you really had to make a conscious mm. decision. My brother, my older brother, he's uh, three and a half years older than me. He had to pay to complete his education in a Catholic mm. school. I didn't. And, and nobody does now. And I think when the government started fully funding the schools that it actually lessened the Catholicism inside the schools. Is there, because the government, if you're going to take our money, then this, these are the standards you're going to teach by? Is that what was happening again? Well, and, and I, I think there wasn't that decision that people were making a conscious choice. It just became the easy thing. Okay. It was never a case that everyone that was going to Catholic school was showing up at Mass on Sunday. I mean, we were still in the minority, those of us, like myself and, and several of my neighbors that were going to the Catholic school and showing up at Mass. Most of the kids in your class didn't turn up, but I would say it's probably even less now. Uh, and, and I think there is a little bit of pressure, whether it's uh, implied or subtle, from the government uh, to, uh, to say, well, no, no, you can go this way. And the church has the legal ability to say no, but the Catholic school board has the legal ability to say no. I don't know that they exercise it okay. as they should. All right, so there's a lot of, of leadership decisions that are really are trickling down to what ends up into the influence of the, cult, the consciences of our young yeah. Catholic students here in America, I mean, in Canada. Yeah, every, yeah. You know, and people are living in the culture, and um, yeah. it can be tough to swim against the tide. I'm assuming, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, and I'm assuming being brought up in a Catholic family with the Catholic environment of the school and the church, that the prayers and the devotions were at least some part of your family upbringing. When you decided to no longer go to the church on Sundays when you're on your own, did that part of your life off, also drift yeah. away? Yeah, it drifted away. Not the phone calls from my mother asking me why I wasn't showing up. but <laughs> They were there <laughs> incessantly probably, yeah. but in a good sense. But personal prayer... Disappeared, devotion. disappeared completely uh, it, until, I mean, when does everyone pray? When things go rough. <laughs> when things go rough, you start praying. And so I would become um, uh, somebody that prayed in an emergency, somebody that prayed if things were really bad, but not the rest of the time. All right. Not the element of Thanksgiving when things go great. Not necessarily, no. Yeah, okay. And, well... Thankfully, Barbara helped bring me out of that. <laughs> All right, Barbara, what about your start of your journey way back when? Of way back when. Um, I was actually raised in the, baptized and raised in the United Church of Canada. Okay. Um, it, um, I, I taught Sunday school. I was in the church choir. We went to church every Sunday. And maybe um, for the audience, the United Church of Canada oh, it's is a... a uh, it was created in about the early 1920s, 1925, the early 1920s, and it's basically an amalgamation of Congregationalists, Methodists, and Presbyterians. Um, Which is interesting, even in that combination of the theologies, and yeah, if there was anything left. The, I mean, that, um, yeah. the church itself was very Presbyterian, the one I grew up in, yeah, okay. the, just sort of very plain, very uh, no statues, no icons, nothing. Mm -hmm. It was just... You know, beautiful stained glass windows, but other than that. Um, but we had to go every Sunday, and I did that until I was probably, I think it was 16 or 17. Mm -hmm. And I sat down with my parents one day and said, look, okay, the thing is this, I'm not really sure I believe in God anymore. Mm -hmm. And my father, who went to church with us maybe once a year, was very upset and told me that I could no longer celebrate Christmas because it was the birth of Jesus. <laughs> and at that point, I said to him, but we don't celebrate it as the birth of Jesus anyway. We celebrate it as Santa Claus, and it's a time for presents and giving. And it's all commercialized. And, you know, my 16-, 17-year-old debate was, was <laughs> I, I was, I thought it did quite well. But <clears throat> um, shortly thereafter, though, I, I just stopped going to church completely. I, don't, I guess my parents just figured it wasn't worth the fight. And I went to church once or twice through my 20s. I was searching for something. I, I kept going into churches. I never stepped into a Catholic church, um, but I would go and sort of sit at the back and think, no, this isn't 
that's not what I'm looking for. Is something's missing, something's missing. And in the early, probably 92, 93, the early 90s, I, every once in a while I would think, well, what about Catholicism? And they go, no, 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 I'm not having anything to do with that. That's, that's crazy talk. <laughs> and it wasn't, it took almost, well, I guess it was about 10 years before I, by that time we were married, we had two children at the time, and I came upstairs one day and said to Brian, okay, the thing is, I think I want to be a stinking papist. <laughs> and I was quoting from a book that I was reading at the time in which one of the characters had talked about being a stinking papist. And he just laughed and, and, I said, and we kind of dropped it for a couple of weeks. And then when I went back to him and said, no, look, the, I really think I'm, this is what I'm supposed to do. So I started, and it was, I felt like a dog with a bone, I guess. I, was, I couldn't let mm. go of the idea. And we had been doing what we called church shopping for years. We had tried a bunch of different Yeah, I was going to back up just a little bit because were you married in the oh, Catholic church? No, no, we were actually married. We were going to be married in, we, when we got engaged, he was Catholic, you, but not really. Well, you were practicing. going. You were. I, I wasn't practicing. I, I would pop in now and again a couple yeah. of times a year, and, and right. knowing I should go to mass, but not necessarily. Yeah. Okay. And I had been to mass with him once at the cathedral. Yeah. At the cathedral in Hamilton, and hadn't gone back at all. When we got engaged, we sort of went back and forth. Well, are we getting married in the Catholic Church? Are we getting married in the United Church? He wanted Catholic. I wanted United because of what we knew growing right. up. And one day I was on the phone with my friend's mother and told her that we'd been bickering back and forth over which church to get married in. And she told me, and she's Catholic, she said, it doesn't really matter which church you get married in. The point is the marriage, isn't it? So I got off the phone and said, okay, we'll get married in the Catholic church. I, was, I thought it was rather big of me, at which point he turned around and said, no, no, we'll get married in the United Church. Oh, there you go again. We're trying to be nice, to, trying each to, be nice to each other. And eventually I just kind of said, look, we're getting married in the Catholic Church. We're just Stop arguing with me. And then we went to look for one, and we picked this beautiful church we downtown new, Ottawa. New to Ottawa. New to Ottawa. So we didn't no really connections know. in Ottawa. No. We just moved here because there was work. Hmm. Yeah. And uh, we, so we found this beautiful church went for Mass and spoke to the priest after Mass saying that we were engaged, we want to get married, we'd like to get married here. And but he's Catholic, I'm Protestant. And he said, that's fine, except I need to know that you're a practicing Catholic. Okay, fine. So you're, I guess you're going back to Mass now, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> However, since was I was the it? other half, I had to go as well. Probably not where it should have been. So, but. yeah. Um, we went back the following week, and I made the mis mistake. I, guess. I said that I, any children that were raised that, that we had, I wanted them to know the Protestant side as well as the Catholic side. And the priest at the time, it kind of tore strip out of me, and mm -hmm. I, I left in tears, oh. thinking I'm never setting foot inside a Catholic church again. N nuts to this. Yeah, um, I, I felt bad because I thought... You know, this isn't uh, what I was expecting, mm -hmm. and then I kept saying to her, "This isn't representative of the Catholic Church." But I was so upset that I just said, "I don't care. I'm Speak, not getting married there." Speaking priests since uh, so. about that, they've they've always said, "Did you speak to the priest right after Mass when he's got twenty people coming at him?" <laughs> I said yes, and they said. Maybe not the best time for a philosophical discussion with a priest. Yeah. They, they said, okay. you know, they, that they're inundated at that point. So yeah. we lived, we learned, mm -hmm. but we kept the church shopping going. So <laughs> we ended up, because of that experience, we ended up, we went for a walk the next day, and we found a United Church in uh, the New Edinburgh section here in Ottawa. And it's a beautiful church. We went to the service the next week, talked to the minister, and said, well, look, he's Catholic, I'm Protestant. Uh, how do you feel about this kind of thing? And he said that it didn't really matter because we're all aiming to get to the same place anyway. So we ended up getting married five months later, four months. I can't remember how long it was. It was a few it months did later. Did get us going back to church? Mm -hmm. Did get us going back so to church? Going to her, and, the, yeah. But we were going to the United Church okay. at the time. Um, did that kind of put your Catholic thoughts then in the back burner? Uh, 
Yeah, I didn't really. So there's no reason to be thinking about that anymore, no. especially since you had such a great experience with that one time that uh, <laughs> exactly. you weren't going to go there again anyway. Yeah. So and yeah. I, I, I knew not to push <laughs> to say, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, yeah. back off a little bit. And Were you comfortable with uh, going to the U.S. United it, Church? It never felt uh, right, and, and, and no disrespect right. uh, to to people that were at the United Church, but it is... Um, in Catholic terms, it is essentially a liturgy of the word most of the time. They don't have uh, communion. It's you know one once of the churches month. that has communion <laughs> once a month, mm -hmm. uh, but they they don't believe that it's the body and right. blood of Christ. It's symbolic. Mm -hmm. It is symbolic. It is a memorial meal. Well, and you did say a few times that it felt like there was something missing. I kept saying I'm waiting for something to happen. So it's okay. essentially they would you know. It, some of the things look the same. They, you know, there's a hymn, and the minister walks in, and, and depending on the church, they're wearing robes that look similar to the Catholic Church, and and then they do, you know, an opening prayer and some readings, and prayer of confession. Th this this all seems very yeah. familiar. Yeah. The minister gives a <laughs> sermon for a long time, and then they sing another song and go home. And I thought, there's something missing mm -hmm. here, and. And I felt that way the entire time. It, I didn't hide that. Um, and for a little while, would once in a while go to Mass, even if we'd been to church. Um, because you know, I just kept saying to Barbara, That's, there's something missing. Mm -hmm. so. And so we were married September 98. Two years later, two years later? Almost two years later, we had our first child. Four months after he was born, Brian got a job in Montreal. Mm -hmm. And... When we got to Montreal, when we were living here, my sister and her, now ex-husband, and their child were here. So we at least had, you know, there was one family member. When we moved to Montreal, we didn't know anybody. Mm -hmm. It was just, it was the three of us against the world kind of thing. <laughs> and we'd been there for a few months, and we started church shopping. And we tried the United Church, the Anglican Church. We tried Catholic. Mm -hmm. um, I can't even remember what. Uh, we finally found a United Church, and we went back to. The, so we ended up at the United Church in Montreal, and we went there every week for a while. And it's about a year. Yeah, I guess it was about a year. Is the Montreal culture radically different than the culture here because of French Canada more than here? Is it? I well, the Catholic it's... churches are generally more empty. Um, oh, interesting. Because so I was wondering if you're moving to a different, it's not just away from family, but I wonder if there's a difference in culture even. In, in, I, didn't, when, I didn't notice a huge okay. difference right. in culture. I mean, but the, it's a big was, city. There's right. been, across Quebec, whether it's Catholic or otherwise, there's yeah. been a bigger rejection of the church. It has oh, definitely. One of the, hmm. Probably the definitely. lowest church attendance in all of North America is so sad in to Quebec, hear. which yeah. is the, you know, the cradle of the Catholic church on this continent yeah. is there. Mm -hmm. Um and so, I mean, that, that's part of it. There's a lot of former churches, a lot of beautiful former churches in that city. Yeah. So you ended up finding the uh, United Church. Well, we went to United Church, and mm -hmm. then... Um, we came back here. Nine, no, 9-11 hit. 9-11 mm. hit. And it was two days after 9-11, and um, they were holding memorial services around the city. And the only one that we could that we could find in our neighborhood that was doing one was a Catholic church. So we went to that one, mm -hmm. and there were people of all denominations there, but it was the only time that I'd been in a church except at Christmas, Catholic or non-Catholic, where it was packed to the rafters. Mm -hmm. And I left, I mean, it was a horrific time anyway, but it was sort of the, probably the start or the restarting of kind of putting the Catholic Church back into my head. Because it was a good, a good welcome. It was a good, yeah. It yeah. Definitely much different than the last mm -hmm. time I had been mm -hmm. in a church, in a Catholic church. And for me, it always just feels like home. <laughs> <laughs> so it doesn't matter how long I'd been away, it felt like home. So, yeah, the 9-11, so that's interesting. Uh, as a person from the States, I always think of 9-11 as a, something that hit us, but it hit you equally well up here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, the, I, I remember know, the where I was standing. Yeah. The airplanes landed here. I mean, yeah. your culture is sure. our right. culture. Yeah. And, um, yeah, no, it's... Uh, 
Yeah, I remember. It was something we all paid attention to. And working in the news media, right. he had to go. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. We, we we lived under um, flight a, path. a flight path, not airport. one of the busiest ones, but under a flight path. And it's but creepy when you're used to planes going overhead. And, and for days, nothing. It was a week. It was a no-fly zone. And I remember being outside one day, and I was hanging clothes on the on the line, and a plane went overhead. And I remember freezing. And it's kind of <laughs> going, oh, okay, they must be letting the planes go again. Yeah, no, it hit, it hit hmm. Canadians hard. Too. I, I remember where I was standing. I was coming out of the shower, and he said, a plane flew into one of the towers in New York. And I said, oh, come on, you're just kidding. That, no. And I went <laughs> and stood yeah, in front like of the... Like many people, not sure I could, it wasn't an accident at yeah, that Yeah, right. and I was standing in front of the television as the second plane was coming on screen, and I was yelling at him. I couldn't even speak. I was like, plane, there's, a, there's another plane. Mm. And just, we stood in front of our port. We had a year old child at the time and he was left in his crib for a little bit while we stood in front of the television just trying to make sense yeah. I, I can't it. Like, it was yeah it, it hit Canadians hard too did it um, do you think when you look back that, was that a, a spark in your own spiritual journeys then? Yeah. That, that event itself uh, well it definitely because I was sort of in and out of a relationship with God, churches, anything mm-hmm. like that. And it was one of those, did a lot of praying mm-hmm. for a long time, going, why? Mm-hmm. I still don't have the answers. I assume he'll let me know when mm-hmm. when he's, he's ready, ready to let me know. <laughs> so, but, um, you know, it definitely, uh, at least, well, at least for a few months it started, then, you know, we sort of got busy with kids and life and stuff, and I sure. but you know, God fall by the wayside for a while. Yeah. Yeah. And then we moved back to Ottawa. Yeah. And we went church shopping again. <laughs> well, I'm also curious, Brian, in this journey, um, has the spiritual life come back into your life, private life at all? Yes, it has. Um, in, in terms of, uh, we're part of a, a prayer group at our church now. Uh, try daily prayer. It doesn't always work the way that it <laughs> <laughs> you plan, um, and the goal is to get up early and, and spend some time in Scripture before the day gets going. When you've got four active kids that get up mm-hmm. at the crack of dawn, that sometimes gets thrown for a loop. Sure. But that, that's what we try and do, and so we're, um, we're part of uh, a few different ministries at the church. Barbara's in the choir. I'm in the Knights of Columbus, uh, uh, part of a, a prayer group with, along with a lot of other couples, and... Um, so we're working towards that and and trying, okay. which is different, and and building on that personal relationship that obviously wasn't there when when I walked away anyway. Yeah. So, but this is being pulled into the more Protestant direction. The influences at that time. You did mention Knights of Columbus, but uh, well, that that's now. That's where okay. We okay. Are no, now, no. Yeah. But but I meant at that time. But where at, she's talking about it, any? No. At at, at that time, I. I still felt like just a Catholic in exile right. when we would go to church. Um, and uh, when we were there, people would say to me, so they would ask me questions, and I would just say, well, I'm Catholic. So I mean, I always identified myself as that, uh, even mm-hmm. if I didn't fully understand um, everything about the church. I mean, that was part of who I was. Um, yeah, I, that was one of the things, that how I described him to my Friends, family, well, he's Catholic. No, he doesn't go to Mass. No, I don't see him sitting in prayer. No, he doesn't, no, but, oh, he's Catholic. It was part of what <laughs> defined him, even if he wasn't actually walking the walk, talking the talk at that point. He was, he was a Catholic. Which probably also defined how you understood what it meant to be Catholic. The model he was setting for you, you think, mm-hmm. at the time? No, she knew I wasn't a very good one. No, I knew oh, okay. wasn't. <laughs> All right, okay, okay. No, she knew that much. Well, no, not I, would, not. I wouldn't say that I didn't know you weren't a good Catholic. I knew that you weren't following all the rules. <laughs> so. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. So then you come back here. Um, Is that right? Uh, yeah, we moved back here, and um, we had our second child. And again, we started shopping for churches, and we couldn't really 
seem to find any place that fit. There were nowhere that felt like home. We didn't even like know home. where the Catholic churches were. We tried mm -hmm. finding them, and we were going driving all over oh, the place. All over the place. Uh, and then found out that we were smack dab in the middle of two of them. <laughs> yeah. well, we had a choice, but we didn't know. But they were both kind of hidden, hmm. and huh? so we we found definitely a gem of the parish, hmm. and started going. Well, we didn't just start going because I told you that I want. I came upstairs and said that I want. I want to be a stinking papist. Because you're reading some book that. Because I was reading a book that uh, one of the characters had talked about being a stinking papist. And okay. That sounded appealing. I liked the line. No. <laughs> so, well, I, just, I knew that Catholics were sometimes called papists. So, <laughs> I'm like, sure. I, don't know. Um, I understood then, what you meant. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was just, I, I wasn't being trying to be rude or anything about it. I was just teasing him. And I started an RCIA course out at a parish out in Orleans. Then I found out I was pregnant, and so I called the deacon who was running the course. Said, okay, look, I just found out that I'm pregnant and I'm due around. Easter 2004. And he said, well, you might still be able to handle it. And I said, okay. So I went for a few times, but I came home two weeks, three weeks in a row, and I was just livid because I, while I was at the, at the course, I felt like I had to defend Protestants. I would mm. ask questions, and there were a lot of time, well, three weeks in a row, where I was just completely shut down, and I felt like my back was up against a wall, and I thought, I'm trying to learn how to become one of you. I don't want to have to, because my family is still sure. Protestant, yeah. and I don't want to have to defend my family's point of view while I'm trying to figure out why you all do what you do, <laughs> and why you believe what you believe. I finally came home, and I said to him, I'm not going back to that place. I don't want to do it. And then, but in the meantime, we had found out that our third baby was actually baby three and baby four. We were having twins. And when I <laughs> spoke to the deacon, said, look, it's twins. And he said, well, you still should be able to do it. Like, was, was he a guy? Yes, he was, he a, was guy. a guy. Yeah. yeah. And I thought, have you given birth to twins recently? <laughs> no big deal, right? Does <laughs> 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 should be able easy. to handle that? No problem. And um, so I just said, look, I'm not going to do this. I used the twins as an excuse to... <laughs> get out of the RCIA course. But I, we went to Mass a few times, and we um, had found Our Lady of the Visitation, the church, that parish that we go to now. And even, I mean, it just, it felt like home the first time that we went in. And we left again. We, didn't, we weren't regular churchgoers by any stretch of the imagination. And it took... The twins were born in, well, on St. Patrick's Day, 2004. It was the following year when I finally became Catholic. So we went, started going a little mm -hmm. more regularly than we had been going. And everybody, one of the things, with four kids, especially, we had a four-year-old, a two-year-old, and twin newborns. We're not exactly quiet. <laughs> <laughs> and... So there were a lot of churches that we went to, even before we settled on Our Lady of the Visitation, where we got a lot of dirty looks because we had four kids. And especially, you know, newborn, newborns, they're not mm. quiet. If they want something, they make a lot of noise. And there were a lot of people that just weren't welcoming. And there were a couple of churches that I walked out in tears thinking, okay, forget that. Mm. They weren't Catholic ones, but well, forget this, I'm not going back. And when we found Our Lady of the Visitation, like I said, it was like going home, mm. and everybody was very welcoming. I mean, of babies, of babies. Yeah. The, you would think everyone would be. Yeah, <laughs> and it was such a surprise compared to the experiences that we'd had in other churches. Right. That I was like, "Oh, okay, well, maybe this is the place to go." And then, um, I which is, I was going to say, sometimes yeah. it's not intentional in many Protestant churches. Mm -hmm. But when the center of worship is a sermon, then the center of that is an adult intellectual experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so all these little voices around here disrupt that. are disrupting that which is central to their gathering. Yeah. I don't think they intend it to be that way, but that's what it can become. The center of our gathering, the homily is great, but that's not the center well, of exactly. it. It's a whole different world. Right? Yeah. So when you finally came in then... Well, you, I... I Did you go through our CAA or you just... No, no? I didn't okay. actually. No, I we, started um, reading. Um, reading. 
I started <laughs> reading, oh, it was Rome. You came home with a book. With it Rome Sweet Rome Home Sweet by home. Scott Hahn. Yeah. And Just Brian, a random bookstore or? A library. Library. It? Public library. Yeah. Browsing the books. Um, trying to feed my own spiritual journey. Mm -hmm. And found that and said, oh. And I, I, this helped him become Catholic. This helped his wife become Catholic. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think this is a book for my wife. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that would have been the fall of 2004. And I couldn't put the book down. I kept reading it. And almost every page I was going, exactly, yes, that's exactly how I feel. Yes, 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 all the way through the book. So uh, when I was finished the book, I said, you've really got to read this book too. And I said, I'm definitely sure that I want to be Catholic, but now the problem is trying to find a parish where we can have a home. Mm -hmm. So um, that's when, I guess that was when we, no, that's not when we decided. It was January. We had a fight one Sunday morning. <laughs> she remembers more. <laughs> I remember, oh yeah, I remember the details. We had a fight, when, I don't remember what we fought about, but we had a fight and I thought, ah, forget this, I'm, I'm out of here. I've, I've got to get out of here for a while. And he asked where I'm going. I don't know, I'm going to church somewhere. <laughs> I left the house. And I had to drive by a couple of churches and I ended up at Our Lady of the Visitation. And I went in, and even though I had, by that point I had decided that I wanted to become Catholic, and I was having a really big problem with transubstantiation. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I don't really, because in the United Church that I grew up in, the wine is grape juice, the, uh, because you know, we don't want to encourage alcoholics to come into church just to get the wine. It's a big part of the temperance movement. Yeah. 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 And it's bread. It was wonder bread. When it was just white bread when Cut I the chunks. grew up. Uh, yeah. 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 So how does this become Jesus? I couldn't wrap my brain around it. And you know, even with him saying, it's just one of the mysteries. You just have to believe it. Going, I can't. I need more than that. <laughs> But I sat in the back of the pews that day, and I was still angry at him. Like I said, I can't remember what it was about. And because I was angry at him, I started getting mad at God. I'm like, okay, look, it seems like you're calling me to this, but you're not really giving me anything to go on right now. I don't understand this part. And when it came time for communion, I stood up to go, even though I knew I wasn't, by that point I knew that I wasn't supposed to go. And as I stood up, I, in my head, I was yelling at God, saying, you know what, you better prove that you're actually in that little, it sounds very disrespectful now, but at the time I was just mad. I said, you better prove you're in that little cracker and in that little goblet of wine right now or I'm walking out of here and I'm not going to become Catholic. And I felt a hand on my shoulder and I turned around to give the person behind me what for, except he was too far away from me to have touched me. And I flipped back and went, that was a little bizarre. And I kept looking back. I'm sure that people walked <laughs> At the church, must have thought they've got a crazy person in their midst. And I kind of looking up the front going, okay, that really, okay, no, no, that wasn't, that didn't happen. I don't believe that at all. And I felt a hand on my shoulder again. And I, again, I flipped around to look at the person behind me. And he was still too far away from me to touch me. He just kind of nodded at me and smiled. And I uh-huh, okay, and I got to the front, <laughs> I'm not taking communion. <laughs> took the blessing. I took the blessing, and I turned around and went back to my seat, hit my knees, and I had tears streaming down my face. I'm sure they thought that was crazy, too, but I left and went home and said, okay, I think I found our church, <laughs> and we're going to Mass. And we ended up speaking with the parish priest, and I said, I started the RCA, RCIA course. It didn't go well. And we ended up sitting down, you and I and Father Brian, for two or three hours. We'd and it going, was just... We'd been going to Mass for a long time at that point. You no, know, we started... And, and had read months. several books. And yeah. when we went to him and, and said that Barbara would like to become Catholic at Easter, he just put, put her through her, her numbers mm. and made sure that she understood the doctrine mm. and made sure that she understood... But he did it in such a warm, I, I didn't feel like it was being grilled. It was, we sat down and we had a conversation for two hours kind of thing. And at the end of it, he stood up and he said, I have absolutely no problem welcoming you into the church. And I got all sluttery and I cried and you know, did a girly thing. Like, oh. So, and um, it was about, 
How long later was it? It wasn't that much longer. A week, two weeks? No, it was. Or was it longer than that? A bit past that. But East, but Easter, yeah, 2005, Easter 2005. A week before uh, John Paul II passed away. Oh, uh, wow. Well. Yeah. Why don't we pause at that point? It's a good place to take a break, and then we'll come back and we'll pick that up okay. in just a moment. All right, we'll be back in a second. Welcome back to the Journey Home program. Our guests for this episode are Brian and Barbara Lilly. And I, I kind of cut you off just when you're on the edge, ready to come into the church. This is back in 2005, Easter, is that? 2005. Right. Yeah. So this is when you came into the church. Mm -hmm. And you're really already in the church. Yeah. So but, I'm coming back home. All right. Mm -hmm. So uh, all through Barbara's um, learning about what the church was and through her process, it, uh, it really gave me a chance to answer her questions by looking up the stuff I should have known already. <laughs> well, we're still learning, right? And, and we're still, still learning, learning because, I mean, the richness of the Catholic faith is immense. And so she would come to me with a question, why do you do that? I don't know. Let's go look it up. And so, uh, you know, Catholic source book, at one point Catholic for Dummy, you know, all these different <laughs> books, pulling them out, the catechisms on top of the piano, Let's find out what's going on, why. And so that was great for both of us. And then as Barbara was going through receiving her first sacraments, I got to reintroduce myself to everything properly in terms of coming back to confession on a regular basis and things like that. So how was your first confession? It was about 45 minutes long. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I got teased about that, but... And, that, and again, that it's truly a first confession. It was a first you, confession. Nothing like that yeah. in, in the but United Church. Some of it was spiritual direction because I'd never done it before. I didn't, I, and I had you know, 30, what, 36 years of you know, <laughs> confessing to make up for. Um, yeah, so it was about 45 minutes long. Father Brian really helped me through it. and It was a good experience. And the thing that I found really surprising about it and that I, Five and a half years later, I still find it surprising, but mm. I look forward to it, is that when I've been given absolution, it just feels like a weight has been lifted off mm. my shoulder, and I feel clean, basically. It's like spiritually clean. It's like, I can handle anything. And I really had that experience the first time that I went to confession. I actually remember so. that from my first confession when I was a child. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Mm. I still remember that. And... It's still there, so I don't know why I stayed away. Uh, <laughs> Foolishness, either. stubbornness, I don't know. But, yeah, you're right. It's there. But not long after hers, you had, were you next in line? or was, it, no, it was just uh, the, the two of us in the church on a weekday, um, along with our, uh, our priest. And, uh, yeah, so I was in there for probably an hour. <laughs> but again, you know, I'll, I'll defend myself. Spiritual direction as well, as, as part of it, which was new to me. I'm not sure they did that when I was going to confession. <laughs> so uh, it's... Uh, well, they may have been doing face-to-face -face where that you probably didn't when you were a child. What, no, they, they had brought that in. Oh, when and, you were young too, okay. Yeah, yeah uh -huh. they had brought that in. You had the option of going behind the little screen or sitting face to face, so, um, and I'm still not sure which one I prefer. <laughs> it depends on the day. <laughs> so you're, you're both in the church. You're in the church. Uh, I suppose it could have been easy to drift back into just basic church going. Had your faith really caught on fire as a result of coming into the church? Yes. I so. Yes, yeah. I, absolutely. Um, and in terms of, um, you know, really at that point on fire for reading the Bible pretty much every day. Somebody had given me a study Bible where I could look up, you know, you're, you're having trouble with this, find the answer in the Bible there, which I don't think Catholics um, 
use that sort of thing enough. It, it's big among Protestants. I think that's something we could learn from them, mm. is, is turning to, to Scripture. I, I don't know how many times I've heard cradle Catholics anyway say, well, I'm Catholic, I don't read the Bible. Um, <laughs> you know, that's, yeah, that's, that's not the way we should be doing it. Right. And, and I think we're, uh, those that view it that way are surrendering uh, a great part of, of what the church is and what the church teaches. I didn't ask you to, ahead of time to make sure that uh, this wouldn't be embarrassing, but gr- praying together as a couple is is a, something that has to grow on you when you didn't have it at first. Had it become easier as a Catholic with the models as a Catholic? We didn't actually really start praying together as a couple until probably about six months after I became Catholic because mm-hmm. by that point we were going to weekly Mass, and I felt like, there's still something more that I feel I should be doing here, but I didn't really know what. And then in the fall of 2000, was it 2005? Mm-hmm. That's when the intercessory group started up? There was yeah. an intercessory prayer group that started up at our church, so I started going to that, and that's when we started mm-hmm. getting together and praying together as a couple. And, I mean, we've got four kids. We don't do it every single day, right. but we do try to make it a regular part and yeah, as we're going stuff. into big decisions on life, mm-hmm. you know, what are we going to do about buying a house? What are we going to do about this or sure. that? Well, we had what a are car we break about- down. The car, we had a van, and it just died in the parking lot of a shopping center one day. With groceries With gro- and oh, we had, meat it was on a hot, hot August, August day. day. <laughs> there was meat and ice cream, and I mean, it was it was not fun. And he got up the next morning and said, "Okay, well, I have to go into the car dealership. We need a car." And I said, all right, well, you have fun with that. And he said, no, no, we're going to sit down. We're going to play the, I'm the Divine Mercy chaplet. And I said, well, okay, go ahead. Have fun. He said, no, no, we're doing this together because we need the car. <laughs> like, okay, you're going to ask Jesus for a car? <laughs> all right, fine. So we sat down, and he prayed very specifically, I need I need a vehicle for it to carry around six people. It has to be affordable. We need this, we need this, and we need this. It's the easiest car purchase I've ever made. <laughs> ever had. <laughs> <laughs> you should do that yeah. for everything. Yeah. Oh. And so, so we, we try to do that for big decisions. Mm-hmm. But, you know, as Barbara was saying, with four kids, um, climbing in and out of bed in the morning, at night, they're always waking you up. Yeah. It interrupts things, but it is something we try to do. And we try to get the kids on board with it as well. Sure. So, I mean, the kids, we say prayers with them every single night. They get a blessing every single night. They, um, they will actually come to us and say, okay, I can't sleep at night. I'm going to go pray a decade of the rosary. Okay, go to. Good job. <laughs> Have fun. <laughs> That's good. Your um, faith had then changed, but you're in the same business. Yes. How about the relationship of this change in your faith and your convictions in relationship to the business that you do? It it can make it more difficult sometimes. Mm -hmm. Um, But I would say some of the um, uh, my positions on some of the cultural hot button topics, let's say, that you deal with in politics, and they're the same on both sides of the border. Right. Right. My views on those never changed, even when I wasn't. So you you even had a conservative perspective way back when then. You've always had that to a certain extent. You know, maybe not necessarily politically, but, you yeah. know, I've, I've just always known that, that abortion is wrong. You know, the to Terry touch Shiva on case. the hottest oh, topic, the the Terry, Terry Shiva was going Terry on Shiva. as Barbara was coming into as the I church. As I was coming into the church, the Terry Shiva case was going on, and we were on completely opposite sides of the fence. And, she, you know, she's just learning what the church what is the teaching church on this. I mean, what an opportunity. And I was telling him, tell no, 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 if I'm in that position, you're to pull the plug. No, I don't want to be kept alive. And he was saying, but no, I can't do it. And there were some rather loud arguments <laughs> was, she, that went on yeah. until the afternoon that she died. And I was watching on television as the news came in saying that she had passed away. And when he got home, I met him at the door and I was in tears, and he looked at me and said, what's the matter, what's the matter? And I said, Terry Schiavo died. And he'd been listening to it all afternoon. He's a journalist. Yeah, right. And he said, yes, I know. And I said, well, see, I, the thing is, I think I was wrong. <laughs> and the only reason, he said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, it has to be God, because the 
only way that my opinion would have been changed is if he had changed my heart. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to cry again. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, it was, and slowly my views on things have come around to the things that he has never changed. Like he said, abortion. He always felt that abortion was wrong. I was pro-choice. Mm -hmm. I'm no longer pro-choice, but I was. <laughs> Um, he was against euthanasia. I was all for it. And so dealing with those things, you know, especially now I report on um, federal politics. You know, it's a, the equivalent of being a Capitol Hill reporter. I'm on Parliament Hill here. <laughs> we deal with these issues. It can make it difficult. Um, now, at the same time, I have to be fair to all sides. Um, You're a journalist. But, you know, I, I, I'm still holding on to my convictions. Thankfully, now I also write a column, and so I can put forward my own <laughs> okay. views on these things. But if I'm interviewing somebody, I, you know, I can't complain uh, about others not being fair to pro-lifers if I'm not fair to the other side in mm -hmm. terms of presenting their own views in the way that they see them rather than skewing them. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it can be difficult sometimes if you really don't agree with somebody to do that, but you have to do your best. On some of these difficult issues like you're talking about, I've noticed a, uh, sometimes a, a, a progress that people go through. At first, they may not like it because the church says it's true. I'm not going there. And then at some point, they get to a stage where they might say, I believe it because the church says it's true. And then they get to a stage and say, well, wait a second. It's true not because the church says it's true. The church says it's true because it's true. Mm -hmm. It's true. It's just that yeah. the church has been the one that's defended the truth all along. Are you still on that progress? Because you've come from way over here. I'm much closer than I used to be, yeah. <laughs> for sure. Um, and you're saying it's one of the, the things that I always liked about the church was the fact, or one of the reasons why I chose Catholicism was that it doesn't change its mind on things just to, because you know because it's in fashion or, you know, I liked yeah. the fact that it was traditional. And, but yeah, a few weeks, uh, when uh, Pope Benedict was, before he was actually, you know, elected Pope, I started going to a tailspin because there was all the uh, reports in the media that we want a really liberal Pope. And I was like, <laughs> well, what did I join you people for if you're just going to throw everything to the wind now? And finally one day Brian said to me, look, it doesn't matter who they elect. No matter how liberal they are, they aren't going to be liberal enough for the liberals. And at that point, I kind of, oh, okay. I mean, you know, people talk in, in oh. politics in terms of liberal and conservative. Yeah, and we, within the church, it means something completely yeah. different. And so I was just trying to say, like, it's not like they're going to come in and change doctrine, even if within the church they're more liberal than John Paul II was. And, you know, the church is the same today as yesterday and will be tomorrow, you know. Yeah. The church does not change. So. One of the biggest things I found about the church that I didn't know at any time before I became Catholic was that the Catholic church is actually about love because I bought into the media hype that hmm. it's anti-gay, hates women. I bought hmm. into the hype. Hmm. And what I've discovered since then is that that is not the church. There are humans inside the church. We mess up all the time because hmm. we're humans. Hmm. But the church is about love, God's yeah. love, and that is just, that's enough to just keep me going on, even if it's not the most popular. Well, I was going to say idea. not the most popular, because here you are coming back to the faith of your childhood, mm -hmm. and you're coming all the way from mm -hmm. not just a, a, a non-Catholic position, but, but a, you know, a pro-choice position mm -hmm. into the church, at the same time that, as you've referenced, sadly, the Catholic culture here in Canada seems to have gone in the other direction. How do you look at that now, from your perspective now, the church around you here in Canada? There are um, bright spots. Uh, I think that um, we didn't have, you know, a, a great time in, in, in terms of the schools and catechism and so on. That's starting to come back. There's some real bright spots in terms of uh, new schools like... Um, a lady seat of wisdom in the Ottawa Valley, which is a great, mm. you know, small liberal arts college trying to start up and, and, and bring back. Because like, like in the United States, a lot of our um, Catholic colleges dropped the Catholic part yeah. and became secular colleges with a saint name. 
uh, and uh, great religious orders like uh, the Companions of the Cross and mm-hmm. you know things that are are bringing the church back to where it was and bringing the, uh, the love of Christ back uh, to the forefront instead of it just being about showing up but not knowing why it's about you know the whole package and um, so I find that really encouraging and it really helps at least it helps me in terms of uh, you know staying on track as far as encouraging, one of the things that I noticed is that when we first started going to our parish, there were an awful lot of empty seats. There were three masses over the weekend, a lot of empty seats. There aren't a lot of empty seats left anymore. Hmm. You we have to used, show up early. Yeah, we used <laughs> to be able to show up five minutes before mass was start and have our pick of where we wanted to sit. Can't do that anymore. If you want a seat, you have to get there. So, do you I'm, know if that's more oh. than just your parish? Are you seeing that around, hearing about it around? Well, I'm hearing about it in I'm other parishes. I'm hearing it in other parishes as well. Sign. So I think there's, there's hope. Yeah. And there's a hunger out there. And, mm-hmm. you know, people want to be fed. Uh, they're looking for something. And I think that you know, the church is finding a way to say, well, we're what you're looking for. And, mm-hmm. and hopefully there's enough local parishes and local bishops that are able to convey the message in a way, I, I, I think things are getting better there. Eucharistic adoration yeah. helps, by the way, too. That's what we found in our parish. Are you seeing that on the Eucharist In our here? parish, we, we started that, and that, um, <laughs> that has worked miracles. They started a few, three or four years ago. It was only an hour once a month kind of thing. And now we have it every Friday from 9 in the morning until 9 at night. Mm-hmm. So... We, and it's there's not other, perpetual. It's not perpetual, yeah. yeah. There's other, oh, St. Steps. Mary's has it, steps, 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. kind of thing. There's baby steps there, but it's coming. Yeah. You have four children. Mm-hmm. Are you seeing that the Catholic families your age are following the being open to life or have a lot of them bought into the cultural soup around them that's more pro-choice or at least... It depends on the family. In our parish, there's a lot of pro-life families, definitely. I mean, Mm. there's a lot of us with three and four children at our parish. At their schools, there still seems to be, we're not much of an anomaly, but no. It sort of depends. Compared to the... um, to some of the other schools in town mm-hmm. that aren't Catholic schools, showing up with four kids would be really strange at our yeah, it's at not our a, school. Not it's not so bad. strange. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Still odd, but not so strange. Mm-hmm. All right, yeah. your week. Excuse me, your work in the media. Uh, I'm. Is there a Catholic influence in the government, or is or is that way down below the radar? Well, it's um, way way down below the radar. You know, there was a, a a book out earlier this year that tried to claim that um, uh, the government was being taken over by factions of the far Christian right, and that we were moving towards theocracy. Uh, it's it's furthest thing uh, from the truth. Um, it uh, our prime minister is uh, an occasional churchgoer. He's not Catholic. There's Catholic MPs. There's uh, there's mass on on the hill that takes place now and again. Uh, we have priests that come in and give talks. Sometimes that creates controversy, though. <laughs> the fact that a priest shows up and speaks to elected representatives has created controversy here. It shouldn't, but it has. And um, thankfully, there's, um, there's prayer groups on the Hill as well to, um, to keep those that are, of us that are trying to practice uh, our faith, um, give you some fellowship and, and keep you on the, the straight and narrow. But one of the sad ironies is uh, most don't know that one of the main impetus behind the American Revolution was the fear that the Catholicism in Canada would creep down into the states. So Sam Adams said that he was more afraid of the Quebec Act and that than he was the Stamp Act. But the irony is that here we are up here, that very center of Catholicism sadly has lost some of its energy, some of its commitment, and that's our prayer that it will come back. And we'll see couples like you rediscover the faith and be part of the great seed of the of the church here in Canada in the future. I mean, are you seeing other couples like yourself rediscovering the faith around you? Yeah, I think especially within our parish, no. We're not an anomaly. We know a lot of younger couples, older couples, couples our age. And I would think that something that's different from 
uh, when I was a kid is that it, you're not showing up. I mean, maybe the children are showing up, but if you're showing up now, it's not due to social pressure. Hmm. If you're showing up now, it's not because, well, everybody else goes to Mass, so you better too. You're showing up because you choose it. Mm -hmm. And if you're choosing it, it's for a reason. Uh, you know, you're showing up for that relationship with God, that relationship hmm. with Christ uh, that you're not getting elsewhere. One of the things that we try to teach the kids is that we're not Catholic just on Sunday. We're Catholic every day, mm -hmm. all day. <laughs> so it's not just on Sunday that we're going to church and saying our prayers. And, you know, we're saying grace before meals. You people, you know, you're thanking God for the food. But I, I've had arguments with family members because my family's still Protestant and they were not all of them really supportive of my becoming Catholic. <laughs> well, why are you saying grace? I went, well, because God doesn't feed me just at Christmas and Thanksgiving. He feeds me <laughs> three or four times a day every single day of the year. So I, you know, we're trying to teach that to the kids as well. Mm. And they will actually keep us on the straight and narrow. There's been a couple of times where I've gone, oh, I'm tired. Do I really have to go to Mass? And if one They'll of four voices us. will say, yes, you do. Don't suggest uh, hamburgers for uh, for dinner on yeah, Friday, or we'll be told as well <laughs> yeah. by the six-year-old a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> you can't eat meat on Fridays. No. <laughs> but yeah. Well, Barbara so. and Brian, thank you very much for, for sharing with us your journey and also for your witness in your family and as well as your work. So thank you both. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on this episode of The Journey Home. I hope it's been an encouragement to you. So God bless. I'll see you again next week.